Good morning. Welcome to Christ Church Worship. This Sunday is the first Sunday in July and the first Sunday of every month we celebrate communion. If you haven't got them right at hand, ready to go, you may want to find some bread and a cup uh, filled with juice, preferably grape juice, even wine can work, uh, but some way where you can celebrate communion with us as our Lord commands us. Bread and cup and Holy Communion and you and me and Christians around the world. Let's get ready to celebrate Holy Communion. If you knew that you had a life-threatening disease that was curable if appropriately diagnosed, you'd want to know, wouldn't you? And if you were told that proper diagnosis was the key to protecting not only you but your loved ones, you'd want to know, you'd want to get the right diagnosis. And you'd want to start that treatment plan, whatever that treatment plan is, wouldn't you? Yet it's so interesting that it seems to be part of human nature that some of us don't even want to know what's wrong with us. Some of us don't want to know because we don't want to have to change. Some of us might even admit that even if we knew it was harming our families, we would find it difficult to change once diagnosed. That's why today we're talking about the conviction of the Holy Spirit, the biblical principle, the biblical insight that says the Holy Spirit convicts you and I of sin. And unless the Holy Spirit does that, we simply continue to be dangerous to those around us. We celebrate freedom on July 4th weekend. We celebrate freedom as Christians when we understand that Jesus is making us free and the Holy Spirit has a terribly important role to play in that. The Lord be with you. Jesus was very clear in teaching his followers that anyone who sins is a slave to sin. But if you follow Jesus, if you live according to his rhythm, his pace, his priorities, if you live in his power, that makes you free. Jesus makes you free. Jesus would have known Psalm 32 very well. Our Psalm of the morning, Psalm 32. I'll put it up on the screen. I'll read the light type, you read the bold face. We'll enter into worship together as we celebrate that the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, as we celebrate that Jesus frees us. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them. I acknowledged my sin to you. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach us. Will you join me in prayer? Gracious Father, great and loving God, we come to you gladly and humbled by your goodness and your kindness, and we look to you for health and hope and strength and integrity. Shape our habits, shape our hearts. Tell us what it means to be free in you. Show us this today, we pray, in the name of Jesus, who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. If the children are nearby, bring them on in. Now's their time. It's time for the children's sermon. Come on in. Oh, hi. I was looking for something in the Bible, and I didn't find it. I was looking for something in the Bible, and I, I tried this. Sometimes you go like this, you can find things in the Bible that you're looking for. 
And I tried this. But I didn't find it that way either. And there's a better way. You can go to the front of your Bible and there's something called the table of contents, right? Table of contents. That means it's a list of where the books in the Bible can be found, what page number you can find them on. And when you find it, you can put a ribbon or a marker there so you, you can find it again. But I looked in the table of contents and I didn't find what I was looking for. I looked in the back. It's got a great list of important Bible words. Some, some Bibles call that a concordance or a dictionary in the back of the Bible. It's added on to the Bible. But the word I was looking for, I didn't find it there either. I was, well, I was looking for the United States. On July 4th weekend, on Independence Day, it's great to think about and talk about and even thank God for the United States. But the United States isn't in the Bible. Nope, there's my marker. That's because the United States wasn't even called the United States when the Bible was written. Israel is in the Bible. Egypt is in the Bible. Lots of other countries and cities are mentioned in the Bible, but not the United States. So what is in the Bible is something very important that I want you to remember. It's in Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7. It talks about what's going on in heaven right now. One thing. Well, several things, but one thing right here in chapter 7. John, who was a friend of Jesus, one of Jesus' students, who wrote the Gospel of John, John is writing. He says, And after this I looked, and before me there was a great multitude that no one could count. Multitude. A great crowd of people. He said, there were so many people. I looked in this vision, and I saw there were so many people. I couldn't count them. People from every nation, tribe, people and language standing before the throne of God and before the Lamb. Now the Lamb here he means is a kind of a code word, a poetic word for Jesus. So Jesus is on the throne and people from every tribe and nation and color and age are standing there and worshiping Jesus. So even if the United States where we live now isn't in the Bible, it's much more important and much better to realize that People from every nation can know God. People from every nation can follow Jesus. People of every language. Some of you know two languages or three. That's amazing. People from every tribe and nation and language, people of every color are loved by God and can love God in return. And I hope you always, always love God and welcome other people. Well, I won't look for the United States in the Bible anymore, but I still will look for God's love and I'll remember that he loves everybody all the time, no matter what. Let's fold our hands, bow our heads, we'll pray. God, thank you that you know everybody and you love everybody. I pray that everybody comes to know you and I pray that everybody comes to love you because I know not everybody does. Thank you that you've put us in a good place. Thank you that you're watching over us. We pray that this country, the United States, is a good place for everybody. And we pray, Lord, that you make this world a good place for everybody. And we know it's not a good place. It can be a very hard place, a very difficult place for some people. So we pray that your love is on every family and on every tribe and every nation. And we pray that people will wake up and love you just the way you love us. Thanks for loving us all the time, no matter what. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me invite you to worship here at 1900 Congress Street, Portland, Maine, on July 19th. We're looking forward to celebrating together again in this same room, the same facility. Uh, it will be both like and unlike what we've done before. There are some constraints on us being able to gather in our particular space. And I wanted to let you know that at least three important changes will be made for these first few Sundays that we're back together. First of all, we'll all be asked to wear masks. Everybody who comes in will be wearing a mask that day for worship, for the duration of worship. And secondly, there won't be any singing. 
to, to minimize the spread, the possible spread of COVID-19. There won't be any singing during that worship service, not from the front, not us all together as a congregation. And we're gonna to try to maintain social distancing uh, as well. Um, these may seem like severe restraints, but I think for many of you, it's going to be very much worth being back together. And for some of you, it will make it more of a hurdle than you'd like it to be. And we understand that. Please know that it is neither more holy to come to worship at 1900 Congress Strait, nor is it more holy to stay away. There shouldn't be any pressure on you either way. But you do need to exercise some wisdom as, as to what's right for you in your particular situation. So we're gonna regather for worship on July 19th and 26th and August 2nd, three trial Sundays as we kind of figure this out. And I do hope you can make it. And I do hope you also feel very comfortable in staying home if that's what fits best your health and your situation. Oh, and I wanna remind you that the online services will continue. Uh, we plan to keep posting them on the Christchurch website, christchurchportland.net. You'll see there's a, there's a worship and blog page you can click on that always has the most recent information from Christchurch on it. And there'll be a click through link there that will bring you to the YouTube service as it's posted. And we plan to, I plan to continue to record these on Fridays and then we'll have a live service on Sunday and we'll see if we can make that work because I think there's a real opportunity for us uh, to celebrate while we're together and continue to celebrate as we need to be separate. From 2 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul urges generosity. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very great trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness and in the love we have kindled in you. See that you also excel in this grace of giving. Many of you have been persistent and generous in your gifts and we thank you. Let's take a look at Independence Day through the eyes of people who are new to this country. I found a, a short film that I think speaks wonderfully well of our ability and, and need to be grateful for what God has granted us. Let's watch together. There was no freedom. People is like have a like really hard life, and they going to the jail, and then government kill them. The entire Sudanese civil war uh, is started in my hometown. Everybody's corrupted. Everyone is corrupted. There's the rebels. There's all these people fighting. They call you slave. Government don't let to us to go to the church. They came on the land and, you know, they were just, 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 just killing everybody. Well, I talked to my neighbor about Jesus. What they did, they fired on us. So everybody had to jump into the water. Her mother started to believe to Jesus, and then her husband killed her. It was nightmare getting separated from your parents. That night, we were just seeing bullets like I thought they were fireflies, but they were actually bullets. Her husband said, if I find who talked about you to the Jesus, I'm gonna find them and I'm gonna kill them too. We escaped and got into the mountains, into the forest. We had actually run uh, quite fast in the... My parents, they say like, we can live here anymore and we found ourselves in a refugee camp in Ethiopia. I lived in a refugee camp for seven years. And we went to the United Nations. I did always pray about getting to a better place. Now that I've come here, I've got the freedom to go to school. Um, 
study what I want, be who I want. You can wear whatever you want. You can go to the church. Here, I have opportunities. I'm studying biotechnology engineering and uh, graphic designing. My master's uh, in accounting. After I finished college, I want to be a lawyer. God always take up the chill and depend on us. I've asked him everything I've ever wanted and everything I've gotten. I mean, I saw how God is good. In the first of our two scripture readings, you'll hear Lucy read from Acts as the gospel spreads from the day of Pentecost outward across the Roman Empire. It touches people in a variety of situations and Paul and Luke here are traveling together and looking to connect with people their lives to the story of God at work in their world. Listen to see where Paul encounters them and what God does through them. Good morning. Our scripture readings this morning are in Acts 16, verses 11 to 15, and in 1 Thessalonians 1, verses 1 through 10. Acts 16, 11 to 15. From Troas, we put out to sea and sailed straight for Samothrace, and the next day on Neapolis. From there, we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony and the leading city of that district of Macedonia. And we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. In the second passage that Lucy will read for you, Paul talks not about a clever speech or interesting, powerful, persuasive tips, uh, Paul talks about the power of the Holy Spirit to reach the human heart and to change lives. Notice how the Thessalonian Christians are allowing the Spirit to work through them. Our next reading is in the first book of Thessalonians, chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. Paul, Silas, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians and God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you, mentioning you in our prayers. We continually remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brother, loved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. In spite of severe suffering, you welcomed the message with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. This is the word of the Lord. We have the opportunity now to gather together in prayer. We put our minds and our hearts toward God and he hears us all, scattered as we are, as if we were together in one room, together in one place, because we are together in the Spirit. Remember, you can stop this video and add your own intercessions and your own praises. I'll pause after a bit and allow you to do that. Let's lift our hearts, our lives, this world, 
to God in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we so need you. We need your holiness. We need your love. We need to become more and more a distinctive people, a different people, an odd people if necessary. If that's what it takes for us to be living out your love, living out your generosity, your generosity of spirit. There are so many in our world, Lord, who are anything but generous toward strangers, generous toward people they disagree with. There's so much activity on the internet and in the media, Lord, that, that lifts up and shows forth just how fractious a people we can be, how, how angry, how divisive, how spiteful, how, how reactive we are against each other. We need a peace that isn't just sort of a, a drawing back from the way the world is. We need, a, we need a peace, Lord, that is centered in you that, that allows us to step into disagreement and listen well, step into disagreement and speak lovingly, to offer a hand to a neighbor or to somebody who we don't even agree with. We need to be able to live differently. We need your power at work in us to live differently. Thank you for the great celebrations that are possible this weekend. Thank you for the long-standing traditions that celebrate liberty and freedom and the kind of prosperity that builds up everyone, not just a few, but everyone. Thank you for opportunities to rise by our own efforts, but we thank you especially for your power at work within us and among us. We trust, Lord, that every good gift, every good gift comes from you. And so we offer thanks to you for every good thing in our lives and every good thing we know and every good thing we remember. Shape, shape us, Lord, by your courage and integrity and your purity, that when we speak, it might reflexively, might instinctively be brave and kind and peaceable. We lift up our world to you, Lord, our own, our own souls, our families, our co-workers, our neighbors, our communities, our whole world, every tribe and nation, Lord, we lift them up to you. Hear our prayers. Precious Father, we ask for the ability to see one another as brothers and sisters, those who love you and those who don't. We realize, Lord, that there's such a different view of the world in people who don't trust you, who don't know you, who don't love you. And we ask for the ability to, to minister to them, to befriend them, to serve them even, if it might, if it might bring them a step closer to you. Give us such glad hearts for the blessings you give us that we are easily and often blessings to others. Shape our world through us. Shape our world in spite of us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. You're about to hear a remarkable rendition of America the Beautiful. Hear it and watch the words. See it and experience it as gratitude toward God for what's good in this world, in this place. And see it also as a prayer to God that he might bless us in the way only he can.
Never forget that God is beautiful and generous and kind and exactly who we all need. Thank you, Flash, for that wonderful rendition. The sermon text for this morning is from the Gospel of John, chapter 16, verses 7 through 11. John 16, 7 through 11. Jesus said, But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the Advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment about sin because people do not believe in me, about righteousness because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer, and about judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. Let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, we don't want to stand condemned. We don't want to be simply people of the world. We want to be distinctively different and distinctively yours, completely yours. Teach us what it is we need to know to make that happen. Teach us what it is we need to know to be fully and completely yours, followers of you who enjoy and experience and share the life you have for us. Warn us away from whatever you need to warn us away from. Invite us into, bring us into whatever it is we most need. We pray in Christ's name, amen. So if you're a doctor, says, hey, you got a condition, you got a syndrome, you got something going on with you that has to be taken care of, or it's gonna shorten your life and ruin the quality of your life. You'd wanna know what it is and what the implications are. You'd wanna know what the treatment plan is too. If you had something wrong with your heart, your liver, your brain, you'd wanna know. And all the more so if what was wrong with you, this syndrome, was not just dangerous to your body, but what was also contagious, was also had effect, real effect on your loved ones, those closest to you. Your mom, your dad, your kids, your grandkids, your spouse. You'd wanna know, you'd wanna get it fixed, you'd wanna get right, wouldn't you? I know some people don't wanna know what's going on with them. So many guys have the reputation for just, I'm not gonna go to the doctor, he'll just find something wrong. You and me both, we got something wrong with us. There's a diagnoser, there's a diagnosis. We need treatment. We need treatment. Now, Jesus, in the beginning of the passage that we read just now, John 16, seven, he says, truly, truly. The King James was verily, verily. Uh, the NIV renders it, very truly I tell you. Anytime he says this, we have to sit up and take notice and be willing to adjust our thinking because he says, very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. I've got to believe the 12 were not happy to hear this. It's not the first time he said it. He said it in this, the same Thursday evening gathered around the table context before he's about to be arrested and killed. It's for your good I'm going away. As followers of Jesus, we immediately, no matter what the, what the dissonance in our mind, whatever the fear in our hearts is, we have to go with what Jesus says is for our good. And he says, I'm going away, it's for your good. You won't believe what a wonderful thing is about to happen. And he means that, I think my paraphrase means two things. He says, you're just not going to believe it. You're gonna have a hard time trusting it. And as a matter of fact, that's what's wrong with the world. They don't trust me. He says, but you, you can't imagine what good awaits you because I'm going away and sending the advocate, sending the spirit. So it's a bad news, good news thing. It's a diagnosis and the, we aren't yet told what the diagnosis is, not in this first few phrases, first couple of phrases. It's a diagnosis and it's a treatment and it's a promise of life far beyond what the patient currently enjoys. So Jesus says, it's for your good, I'm going away, I'm going to send the advocate and when he comes, now we look carefully at the text again because 
what will this advocate do, the Holy Spirit do? It is for your good I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, here's what the advocate's task is. He will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. Gospel of John, when we encounter the world almost every time, when we encounter the, wor the word world, he's talking about those who are outside of God, those who think like the world thinks. For God so loved the world, yes. God did not condemn, come to condemn the world, yes. But the world needs saving. The first task of the advocate, the Holy Spirit, is to prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, verse 9, because people do not believe in me. What does it mean to believe in Jesus? Chapter 8, John says, if, of John, he says, if, if you hold to my teaching, if you live into my teaching, if you do what I say, if you immerse yourself in it like, like, like God told Joshua not to be afraid, but to immerse yourself in the, in the word, in the Torah. If you hold to my teaching, then you really are my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. John 8, 31 and 32. If you hold to my teaching, if you do what I say, that's what loving me is, that's what following me is. And the Holy Spirit will prove that the world is wrong about the most important, the most basic things, what it means to be a human being. Because Jesus claims that he is the measure of humanity. He, he claims that this is what a human being is to look like. And because we have the, the context and we have the experience and we have the study and we stand on the shoulders of, of people who have read scripture earnestly for 2000 years, we know he's right. We know Jesus is absolutely right. This is what humanity is to look like. It's to look like Jesus of Nazareth. And the Holy Spirit's job is to come and to show the world, those who think worldly, in a worldly manner, that, that Jesus is the standard and everybody else who doesn't follow Jesus is in the wrong. To convince the world, to convict the world. Now, I want us to be very careful here because what Jesus is, is saying, he's not, this is not a kind of a tribalism where he says, everybody who goes to church, thumbs up, it's good, they're in the right. Everybody who doesn't go to church or isn't an evangelical is in the wrong. He's not doing that. Because for Jesus, it's very clearly those who do what I say. And you know it's entirely possible to call yourself a Christian, to call yourself a follower of Jesus, to be even have perfect attendance at church, whatever that means to you. Perfect attendance at church, whether it's worship service or youth group or uh, the, the ladies group or the men's breakfast, whatever. Perfect attendance doesn't cut it if your heart is in the wrong place. Perfect attendance, diligence, external um, conformity to the tenets of the religion is not the same as following Jesus. Lip service will not get you into the kingdom. Lip service is not the same as following Jesus. Matthew chapter 7, many, Jesus says, many will call me Lord, Lord, but they haven't done what I said. And I'll say, I'll say, I never knew you. So the Holy Spirit's first job of these three, and we're going to keep it to just the first one today. The Holy Spirit's job is to convince the world, to convict the world of sin. And sin is not believing in Jesus. And Jesus defines believing in Jesus as following Jesus, doing what Jesus says, reordering one's entire life around Jesus. Now, this is very important to realize as not tribalism, but as he's got his eyes on you and he's got his eyes on me. And he says, I love you. You're living a self-centered life. Here's the way to freedom and peace. Follow me. And then he watches and waits. Will you respond? Will you take a step toward him? Will you who call yourself a Christian take a step toward Jesus today? Will you who, you may be sitting with a Christian who has invited you to watch this and you don't have any 
feelings plus or minus for or against Jesus. You just, you just want to kind of honor the friendship or the, the relationship you're in and you're sitting there, will you take a step toward Jesus? Because Jesus is the measure of humanity. Jesus is the son of God and the, the sinless one. Jesus is the one who died so that the world could be saved through him. We attach ourselves to his righteousness. We receive his gift. The Holy Spirit's job is to say, okay, it's time to decide. The Holy Spirit has come to convict the world, to give the, the world, everybody in the world, the diagnosis, you're terminally self-centered. It's gonna shorten your life. It's gonna ruin the quality of your life. Being self-centered ruins the quality of your life, even though we, we here in the US live in a culture that absolutely celebrates self-centeredness. Unless, of course, it celebrates uh, mass action of one group against another. But that's just a larger version of the same thing. I need to get what's coming to me. We like to say, we like to think. We don't like to think that we think that, but we like to think that. Or we need to get what's coming to us is what we like to say, what our actions say about us. So the Holy Spirit's job is to convince, in other words, convict, the world convict you, convict me that, you know what? We are terminally self-centered and until we accept that diagnosis, we cannot know true freedom. Until we accept the diagnosis that we are sinfully self-centered, self-centered in our sinfulness, not just the individual acts, but it's just part of us. And we feed that part of us. Until then, we are dangerous to ourselves and dangerous to others. That's what sin is. Sin is always corrosive. Sin is progressive. It's corrosive because the more you indulge your sin, the easier it is to do so. Addiction is just that same process writ large. The more you feed your addiction, the bigger it grows and the more it demands. The more you feed your self-centeredness, the bigger and the deeper it grows and the more it demands of you and the less satisfying it is. So you chase it some more by feeding yourself whatever the next thing is that brings you pleasure. Whether it's winning an argument or eating something that's not good for you or whatever else it is in your particular context. The Holy Spirit's job is to say, I see that. This is exactly what it is. I'm not mistaken about it. It will shorten your life, it will ruin the quality of your life and it will harm your loved ones. Your self-centeredness will harm your loved ones. Your unwillingness to deal with, to accept the diagnosis of self-centeredness will harm your loved ones. Your unwillingness to do anything about the correct diagnosis of your sinfulness will harm your loved ones. So when Jesus says at the beginning of this passage, John 16, 7, it's for your good that I go away and send the advocate, the Holy Spirit, and his first task in this passage is to convict the world of sin. Jesus isn't being a killjoy. Jesus is saying, I know the diagnosis. I know what you suffer from. I am willing to die to break the power of that in your life. And the remedy is to trust me. The remedy is to trust me with your actions, with your habits, with your priorities. Jesus says, I am going away so that the spirit can be available to everyone and to everyone who will listen, the spirit will witness here. Right here's the problem. Right here's the problem. It's gonna kill you, but not only is there a cure, there is joy beyond it. There is joy even in the process. So Christianity then, following Jesus, better phrase, following Jesus is is always in part about sin, about our self-centeredness and even sin embedded in institutions and cultures, cultural practices. But it is never primarily about sin. Following Jesus is about recognizing the diagnosis the Holy Spirit makes and following his treatment plan. Following Jesus is learning to live through and beyond our, our chosen, disability, our brokenness, another word that's helpful, not complete, doesn't tell the whole story. 
The Holy Spirit says, I know why you're so fearful all the time. You're so afraid people will find out that you're self-centered. I know why you're so angry all the time because you want to be in control. I know why you're gossipy all the time because you just need to feel like you're above somebody else. I know why you're lustful all the time because you think you're the center of the world and you deserve whatever pleasure you can find for yourself. And you know, you know, you know, that sin doesn't satisfy. It is corrosive, it will kill you. And there's a better way. We come to the communion table because Jesus died to break the power of sin in our lives. We come because the Holy Spirit has witnessed in our hearts and is witnessing in our hearts and will tell us again when we need to hear it that we need his holiness, we need his love, we need his purity, and he can give it. Conviction of the Holy Spirit is, is, a, is, a, is a powerful biblical theological life phrase that means I admit it, I get it, I hear it, I understand it, my, um, my mind is convinced I am, I am a, a, a self-centered black hole if left to himself will consume everyone and everything around me. And by the grace of God, by the kindness of God, by the death and resurrection of Jesus, it doesn't have to be that way. And by the grace of God, by the death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus, there is power to live tremendously differently. So what ails us, there's a cure for. It doesn't come in pill form. It comes in scripture. It comes with a consistent witness of the Holy Spirit who not only points out our sin, but points the way forward. Who not only points the way forward, but gives us the power to take that next step. You've seen somebody try to recover from a back injury where they have to learn to walk all over again. Part of following Jesus is just like that, holding on to the rails for dear life to take that next step. Won't you take that next step? Ask the Holy Spirit what he wants you to work on in your life now. Don't worry about the whole world for the moment. Don't worry about your spouse for a moment. What does the Holy Spirit lay on your heart that he wants to work with you on to save you? Because our salvation is not just that we recognize that Jesus is Lord and we are not. Salvation is also the working out of that salvation, that work in us to want to do, to will and to do God's good pleasure. Ask the Holy Spirit what he wants to work on in you. Trust him, cooperate with him. He'll bring you life, life and peace. Let's pray. O Holy Spirit, fall on us. Purge us clean, empower us to take that next step, wobbly step, but next step forward from wherever we are. Holy Spirit, show us again the life of Jesus and the heart of Jesus toward us that he may find us, that we may surrender from our hiding places, that we may be whatever kind of lost sheep we are, that we may be recaptured, reclaimed by him, loved by him and brought to safe pasture. Thank you that Jesus is the good shepherd and that you can convince our hearts of this. Thank you that you know more and know better than we do. Thank you, Father, that you are love all the time. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. The hymn that can prepare our hearts for the sacrament of Holy Communion today is Savior like a shepherd lead us. We can trust Jesus with our lives. Let's stand together and sing. Savior like a shepherd lead us.
Will you join me in reciting the Apostles' Creed? You'll see it here on the screen. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Lord Jesus pours life into us as we share his life, as we participate in the bread and the cup and take his life into us. We need it. It's remarkably available. Won't you join me in celebrating the Lord's Supper, the sacrament of Holy Communion? The Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed. Think about that, on the night he was betrayed, not when his group had finally gotten their act together, not when he was finally recognized and fully appreciated for who he was, but on the night when he was betrayed. He took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, it's broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, for your courage, for your wisdom, for your complete self-sacrifice, for your willingness to sacrifice yourself on on behalf of distracted and confused and conflicted and just stubborn people, we give you thanks. Be in this bread and this cup that as we partake of them, we take you into us. We need you, we love you. In the name of the risen Christ, we pray, amen. So take the bread that you've brought for this occasion and the cup and share it among yourselves, offer it to one another, saying the body of Christ broken for you. You take a piece of the bread and dip it in the cup, and then you may eat as you're served. Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. Jesus said, I'm the living water. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And as we follow Jesus, we do find life. We do find the Father. We are chastened and quickened and given life by the Holy Spirit. As you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, continue to live in him. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace now and always. Amen. Go in peace.